So this started as a little bit of a, I don't know, hobby project, curiosity project turned rabbit hole turned other things. Um, and a little bit of frustration with some existing ways of doing things. Right. So, uh, on one hand, I, a little, a little bit of background. I, uh, had a Linux box that had email notifications about SSH and had it on a non-standard port. But apart from that, really didn't do much to secure it. It made sure the password wasn't going to be easily cracked, but I'm like, yeah, I'm kind of curious to see what happens. And then I started seeing command injection attempts in the username field. And I said, yep, nope, we're not having that. So uh, I locked it down a little bit more. And uh, one of the tricks I'd always heard was using GPG keys for SSH. So you can have them on a security key like the YubiKey. But that had drawbacks. And yeah, so I finally got around to sort of documenting documenting uh, what you can and can't do and maybe should and shouldn't do. So uh, topics covered. If Zoom catches up with me, I have switched on my screen. Maybe. I need to like actually click. I mean, I'm I'm on. Okay, I'm like this isn't just me. This is Zoom. Yeah, it looks like my uh, local Zoom has uh, crashed. Well, you've still got the videos going. Well, but that's probably just playing from your camera. Does anyone else have my topics covered slide? No, it's just the title slides. We can see. Yeah, it right just now. securing oh, SSH. Well, let me stop sharing and try and reshare because perhaps it's an issue on my side. I don't think so. This is just going to be one of those really bad days, apparently. Okay, let me. Uh, meeting is being recorded. Got. Oh, apparently I had to click dot it for the meeting being recorded. Well, it's nice to see that Zoom is doing the right thing here. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, y'all have been able to hear me, though, correct? Yes, I see you too. Coming across okay, cool, uh, my great. audio here. Okay, just making sure. Oh, yeah, that's right. But just making sure. Um, okay, great. Let's share. Looks Let's like share. it's working. Andy can edit out all my, my, my fumbles afterwards before posting to YouTube. All right, topics covered and not covered. Uh, so I'm going to cover a little bit about password versus keys key types, uh, including GPG or open PGP or however you want to term that. Uh, technically it's open PGP implement as implemented by GPG. Um, two factor using U2F keys such as the YubiKey um, or Fiation or HyperFido. Um, 2FA using TOTP. Uh, failed to ban, I'm gonna touch on, uh, you know, you can see the slides here. Uh, stuff I'm not gonna cover is anything once you get into the box. Uh, or philosophies about key protection and whatever's and password strength, all that sort of more basic or more advanced, depending on how you look at it, uh, security stuff. I'm not, I'm not working on those today. Um, and software and heart. Oh, hello. Come on, Chrome. Oh, I see. I'm sharing the tab. Okay, that works. After one hardware use. So as I mentioned, I'm using FIDO keys specifically. Uh, as part of my testing, I, I, I carry around, well, when I'm testing, I carry around a couple of Yuba keys. These are both five, uh, five series. I have a 5C and a 5A, I guess you'd call it. They just call it the five. Um, my XPS 13 that I'm on only has USB-C ports. So I'm just gonna use the C for the demo later, assuming that works 50-50. Um, FIDO back to SSH keys, which I'll touch on here a little bit more, but it's basically the ones that are either ECDSA or ED25519 that end in SK. Um, GPG or GPG2, open SSH 8.2. That's very important that it's 8.2 or higher because that's when they introduce native support for those dash SK versions. Uh, my remote machine is an Ubuntu 2204 desktop edition running on a Dell 5430. Um, I'm actually not using fail to ban. I installed it, but I didn't configure it or anything. So I don't care. Um, and then these other things are restricted SSH keys. That's a package. I could not tell if it's only available in the Debian based distros or if it's available elsewhere. 
it is available in Ubuntu without modifying the standard repos. Uh, so I've got that. And then the LibPAM Google Authenticator, which I know is available across multiple uh, distro variants. Uh, and then, of course, crypto algorithm restrictions, that's also built in. Uh, side note is that if you want that ED25519 variant of the security keys, it needs to be not only FIDO, FIDO2 compliant, but specifically the only keys that I found that worked with it are YubiKey 5 series that have a firmware version of at least 5. Point, I believe it's 2.4. Um, this one is 5.1 point something and does not support those keys. Uh, those are also apparently known as the resident keys with FIDO, which I'm not going to dive into super far because again, this one doesn't support it. And it's it's sort of a, a whole nother rabbit hole in and of itself. So, uh, oh, no, I double clicked. Let's talk about uh, key-based off. Just real basic, right? Uses uses RSA keys instead of passwords. Uh, so it's it's more secure, right? You're not typing a string of memorable characters. You are uh, having a string of not very memorable, hopefully 4,096 bits worth of entropy uh, key to help secure your stuff. Uh, and it's really, really super simple to set up. I've, I've got a screenshot here from terminal output, right? <laughs> Password authentication, no. PubKey, yes. Yeah. Great, that turns on PubKey. Locks it down so that you can't log in uh, with user pass. It has to be user and PubKey. And uh, one of the things that I like about it, you might view it as a negative, is that you can generally back these up uh, or otherwise store them in other fashions as well as uh, potentially on various hardware keys similar to these, but again, more on that later. Generally more NTP than passwords and you uh, can set stuff up client side, use different keys for different things and different aliases. And uh, you know, yes, you do have to touch both sides of the computer, but you're gonna have to do all that anyway for any of these things. Uh, and it's been supported forever and almost everything supports it, including Various automated processes can use keys. Uh, you can password protect a key. It's if you're not using keys at a minimum uh, for your security stance, then you should be. And uh, you can see that if you try and log in uh, to something that needs a pub key without using a pub key, you just get permission denied. Pub key telling you try again using this method. So uh, another uh, type of uh, security thing here that I see tossed around a lot. This is not my preferred way of doing it, but it is possible and it does work. And it's it's one of those kind of does what the box says on the tin type things. I was really impressed that it worked the first time using some random tutorial I found online, uh, which by the way, at the, at the end of this, I'll have a, a QR code with the link and whatnot. I, my speaker notes are almost entirely just links to where I found the instructions for doing the stuff on the slide. Um, so if you're curious about that, hang around till the end or watch, or if you're watching a recording, you know, go skip to the end and see what you want. Um, so Jared, is that actually a QR code in the, the yes. shell? Wow. Yes. You do this and, you, and if, if the demo works, I'll generate another one just so that you can see it. But uh, yeah, it uses some sort of, you know, color coding and block lettering to generate a QR code in turn. Now, granted, this is a GUI terminal. I have not attempted this in a like Alt F4 style terminal, um, which on Windows is yet another type of terminal called get out of here. But anyhow, um, it's TOTP, right? So it's it's thing that we're all used to and all love and hate and can store the keys in our password managers and then make it 1FA. Um, you can't view the terminal. Uh, so, it, Will, I, I was talking about the uh, the screenshot on the slide deck. Is it too small? I think he was thinking there was an actual terminal. Oh, I can't okay. see either, and the slide deck is like so far away. But whatever, I can still listen. Okay. Yeah, it's. I, I I'm gonna blame Zoom here. It is rather small, though. I uh, I was trying to include as much stuff there as I could, and well, pick one. But yeah, uh, it is a screenshot of when you're setting up Google Authenticator. It gives you the QR code, a bunch of backup codes, and yes, 
Those are the actual backup codes. So I'm going to need to make sure to take this box offline after this talk. Um, granted, you don't know the password yet. I'll tell you later. Um, that box is on separate network and all that. So I'm not worried about it. You can't hop into my network from it. Well, so anyhow, um, but it's TOTP, right? You, you have the little app on your phone and you scan the barcode and it gives you six digits and it rotates every 30 seconds. Uh, you can uh, storage location. So per host, uh, when you're setting up the, the doohickey, you can tell it like where to look by, by default. I don't remember if it was in, in, no, it wasn't in Etsy. By default, it's in basically the dot SSA. It's a dot Google authenticator directory, I believe. Um, the tutorial I was using said, change it to dot SSH. And so I did. So there's a Google authenticator file in the dot SSH um, thing. You can force or exclude TOTP when using keys. So that was really nice that you can change the two. It's not either keys or TOTP. You can actually do both to make it true second factor with the strong auth of keys. Um, so yeah, it's a cool thing. If you are a fan of those and not necessarily uh, any other two factor methods, then go for that. Yeah. So like, let's say if you've got a, a key, that's the key that you're using and you log in with that key, you then get the TOTP op. Does that go through like a push notification to the Google Authenticator or is it like you have to tell it? Well, it's strictly, uh, the question was if it gives you a push notification or anything. Uh, the answer is no. As best as I can tell, this doesn't support any of the advanced features. It is strictly a TOTP seed. Uh, that generates a six digit code and you have to type the code. Now, if you're using a software authenticator, like in your password manager, you can totally just copy and paste it from the password manager and not have to type it from your phone. Um, I actually have A and D OTP, which also lets me export the keys if I want. Uh, and, and so therefore I actually have it on two different phones, but it's, it's just straight up by, uh, uh, where the camera, there we go. It's just straight, you know, six, six digit code that expires in 30 seconds. Oh. Um, next button, maybe, maybe, yeah, here we go. Um, oh, one more note on the TOTP is that it requires host modification, but no client side modification. It, it just whatever client you're using automatically, just like it prompts you for a password. If you're doing password auth, it'll prompt you for verification code, which you can see in this screenshot. Um, so you, there's no modification client side. FIDO backed keys are sort of the other way around. FIDO backed keys require no changes server side apart. I mean, apart from that, you obviously have to put your authorized key in the authorized keys file, um, but it does not require installing any software. Like with the Google Authenticator, you have to install that module, configure PAM to use it, that sort of thing. Um, FIDO backed keys are great because they are two, two factor and they are, if you're using a hardware device to generate them, they are hardware backed. So uh, yeah, it, the, the concerns about maybe copying the seed from a TOTP app are gone. Um, the only concern is that somebody steal the device and that bit of code that is known as the private key. Um, you can also still encrypt the private key. So, you, so as you can see in the uh, poten potentially sheet, see if it's big enough in the lower screenshot, um, I actually have something, something along the lines of four factor authentication going here. So I have to type in the uh, passphrase to unlock or decrypt the key. Um, I have to tap my YubiKey to say I'm confirming my second factor. Um, the user's password to the computer. So even though password auth isn't, isn't enabled, uh, something I did with the config turn, turned on asking for a password in addition to these other things, not instead of. Uh, so I type the user's password on the remote machine. Then the verification code, which does not show it as you're typing it, Similar to when you're typing a password in a terminal, it doesn't show it, but I typed the six digits and it let me in. Um, again, the thing I really liked about FIDO backed keys is that I can basically safely back up my private key wherever I need it without worrying too, too much about it because unless someone steals my physical hardware authentication dongle, um, that private key is, is more or less useless to them, uh, which is real great. That's, that's how it should be, in my opinion. Uh, and again, it works with aliases and .ssh slash config and yada yada in your home directory. Uh, now, open PGP keys, the, the thing that I love to hate. 
and that some people love because they've been doing it this way for a while. Because until OpenSSH 8.2, which I believe came out in like late 2020 or early 2021, it's relatively recent. Um, this, this was really the only way to use a hardware-backed solution to help support uh, SSH uh, that I'm aware of, at least, at least the only very easily consumerly accessible option. Uh, and basically what this does, uh, for those that don't know, open PGP keys or GPG keys uh, can be used since they're just RSA keys like SSH uh, in, in, well, I think it may be DSA, but semantics. Um, you can use them for SSH authentication and they don't have to be on hardware. You can just use them. I don't know why you would if you're not putting them on hardware. Uh, I don't, I don't really see the benefit there, but you could, um, it does not, again, no special configuration server side. You just convert the, the format of the pub key. Cause if you've seen a GPG keys, they have like, you know, the tech, 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 begin open PGP, yada, 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 tech, 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 excuse me, bunch of base 64 data on a bunch of different lines. And then a bunch of tech, 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 end private key, you know, tech, 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 or end public key, you know, whatever. The private, public and private are basically uh, the same in terms of the the format it uses. Just just the words are a little different. And if you've done an SSH key, you know that it's basically just one big long string of base sixty four ish looking stuff. Uh, so you you need to convert that. Now it does require some client side modifications. And my main reason against this, even though I'm okay with the FIDO sort of tricks you have to do client side, is because this breaks certain SSH stuff. Uh, so in fact. It doesn't appear to properly read the .ssh config folder anymore, uh, in part because uh, it's GPG agent. You're no longer really using SSH agent, which is normally client side, what handles a lot of that client side stuff, like asking you for your keys and checking the config file and yada, yada, yada. I was actually troubleshooting uh, with one of my mentors a, uh, an issue where I just couldn't freaking get the .config file or the .ssh slash config file to work in my home directory. And even, even like I could, I could tack I and specify the key. I just couldn't get it read the freaking config file. Well, it turns out that computer about two, three years ago, I had configured for a GPG auth and uh, that effectively bricked it. It wasn't reading the config file properly or potentially at all. And uh, it frustrated me to no end. And that was when I said, you know, screw it. I'm, I'm going to write all this down and try and make a presentation about it and educate others on why GPG keys are bad for us even though they're better than no keys. Um, the sort of downside to this though, although this is, this is a Linux group, so I'm not gonna dive into this too far, uh, but GPG agent stuff and GPG keys as SSH keys are pretty well supported pretty much everywhere, uh, including Windows. Like their, their stuff, there are several different ways of using them on Windows, including from a hardware key. And I've done them and it kind of just works. Um, Heck, even, even with, with Chromebooks and their SSH stuff that's built in, I've had better luck with GPG than with the FIDO back stuff, which is really sad because, you know, Chrome supports FIDO natively. But anyhow, um, it's, it's a thing. My, my, my philosophy is, and again, I'm not getting too far into philosophies. That's, that's for a whole nother debate. Uh, vary on this, but if you generate and store the key on a YubiKey, which the YubiKey lets you generate the GPG key directly on the YubiKey. Uh, security, in my opinion, is almost as good as FIDO back keys. Depending on you ask, it might be better again, philosophy, uh, but you can uh, uh, pen protect it on a YubiKey. Um, and I believe other smart cards as well. Uh, even though I, have, I did not get the key encryption to work properly on that because uh, it didn't. It didn't appear to support both having a passphrase protecting the key, and the pin. Even though with Fido you can actually do both of those. Uh, because this is something that that's taken me a long while to figure out, and I've used it more than I care to admit. And I don't want anyone to use it anymore. I dedicated the second slide to it to talk a little bit more about it. And uh, yeah, so running client side, uh, you need to. I put this thing in dot bash underscore custom. And then I source it from like bash RC and bash profile and all those others, because I really make modifications that I only want to run over SSH or only want to run when I'm logging in locally. I just want them to run all the time. Uh, so I make dot bash underscore custom. And as far as I can tell, that's just my little thing. Nobody else actually uses that syntax. 
And uh, yeah, the S export string, I don't fully understand what all of this does. I understand it enough when I need to troubleshoot and that's it. Uh, but it does those two things at the beginning of a shell. And then at that, uh, in your home folder, the GNUPG, uh, gpgagent.conf, all it needs to contain is enable.ssh or enable-ssh support. That's it. I think mine has a new line after it, uh, but you don't need to, to futz with anything else. And that, those two things together seem to just kind of work. Um, the way that you generate the open PGP directly on YubiKey, mm -hmm. it's not super well documented, but basically you use the GPG tools and then run card edit from the GPG tools with the YubiKey plugged in and you can, you can generate the key. Um, I saw a lot of stuff talking about, oh yeah, you need the, the public key format change for authorized keys. And there's this program that converts it and you install this program and then pipe, pipe the key through it. And I'm like, but why? GPG has it built in. You just use uh, GPG tac tac armor, which is your typical command for exporting, but you just add tac tac export SSH key and it outputs it in the format for an SSH key. Uh, so you don't need an extra program uh, if you don't want to. And oh, there it is. Yeah, I put it at the bottom open PGB to SSH is the program that people were telling me to install. Uh, and again, by default, this is just pin protected. YubiKey is something like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and the admin pin of like one, two, three, four, or something like that. But anyhow, um, I think I might have double clicked here when I didn't mean to. So I'm waiting for it to catch up. Um, yeah. Uh, yes. And okay. The question was if I'm, if I'm following the export command. So, okay. Yeah. I was going to say, so I know that one of those is shell expensing and it puts it into a variable. And then it's relaunching the agent, but I don't understand the GPG com for why it needs to be in that variable. Okay, so it's similar to back ticks. Okay. as an environment variable that could be referenced later on by other stuff. Oh, okay, so apparently that GPG conf or the GPG agent then uses that SSH and auth socks variable that was populated from that first command that was exported. Okay, I'm following now, yeah, yeah, yeah. You need that variable. Yeah, and why? I don't know. Who <laughs> knows which directories to use. Oh, that's the directory that uses. Okay. Yeah. See, we got we got Sean over here. He knows the stuff. Yeah, it ends up being what uh, socket, uh, which in Linux is and Unix is just a file. Okay. Hand waving magic. Yeah. Okay, I'm following you. All right. Uh, host lists allow and deny. I'd kind of like known this was a thing. I didn't know it was this easy. Um, I've never actually touched this. I don't think, at least not in the past decade. Um, but I'm going to more now. Um, so it's literally just a file at chost.allow and etsyhost.deny. Uh, you can put in IPv6 stuff, host name, domain name. Uh, an example config here is, uh, you know, the sshd colon all uh, and the deny and then allow the one you want in the allow. Uh, it appears to just kind of drop traffic or ignore you if it's in the deny. So I didn't take any screenshots or anything. It's not like it rejects you and tells you like pub key only similar to, you know, if you're trying to off to something that needs pub key and only has in your typing and or wanting to do a password. Uh, so it just is like you in map it and it says filtered. Like it's just, it's just not there. Um, you can do host name matching, host name or IP matching, which by the way, I did not get domain name or FQDN matching to work in any of this. And I'm sure that if I would have fiddled with it, I could have, but uh, I didn't care that much. The docs say it works and I got it to work with IPs and that was good enough for me for the purposes of this presentation. Um, but anyhow, in your authorized keys file, there are some really cool things you can do that I never knew about. If you at the beat, so I knew that at the end, you could kind of put whatever you want. Like it can be notes and whatnot on the key. And by default, it's just user at host is sort of the format they put there. But at the beginning, you could do all these cool things too. So if you put from equal sign and then double quotes around your host name or IP address, uh, you can 
restrict it to that public key now only works for that user from that IP address. So if the private key gets stolen and they figure out what it's to, unless somehow they also have the IP address that's there, uh, yeah, you don't have to worry about it that much. Still would rotate the key, but it's not a huge issue. Uh, Andy, can you or pull up the chat there? Uh, yeah, so Jordan is saying the uh, other stuff that uh, can use uh, the off sock uh, environment verbal includes other SSH agents. So like KeyPass XC has a SSH uh, agent interrogation and can use keys stored as attachments inside your password database. Oh, cool. So potentially, if I played around with that in the config file, I might actually be able to get the SSH config file to be read properly by GPG agent or similar. That's what that sounds like. Well, that's pretty cool. Excuse me. Um, Bail the man. Uh, this is another one of those that I really uh, I didn't do much with. I said, yep, it's there. I've done. I have done this before. I have actually implemented this before. I pulled up the documentation again and just said, no, 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 not for this. I don't care that much. Um, I don't know for sure. If I, my recollection is correct, fail to ban doesn't really do a whole lot. If you're doing key based anyway, it seemed to care more about the auth attempts for passwords. And it didn't seem to count a port knock with, with a wrong key as a attempt. Uh, so whatever it's, it's a good idea, especially if you have to allow passwords, you better be using fail to ban or something similar. Um, it can take different actions. Uh, you don't have to just ban, but banning is obviously the most common one. You could have it email or something else. I've seen uh, some notes of people that are basically just using it as email notifications. I do that differently. That's that's a few slides out here. Uh, but you can configure, you know, retries, lockout time, uh, you know, how aggressive it is, if it kicks you out after one bad attempt or if it, if it waits a few, that sort of thing. Uh, Jared, uh, just to just to add on to that, a uh, fail to ban, yeah. you can actually use that for uh, a lot more than just SSHD. You can use it for pretty much yep. anything that's accepting an external connection, yep. so your HTTP server, um, yeah, basically anything. Yeah, so and the the host allow and deny is the same thing too. Like there are, there are a bunch of different things. That's part of the reason that you actually have to include the SSHD because it supports like Apache. It supports I don't even know what else. I saw a bunch of stuff in there. Uh, but fail to ban is far and away like configurable for all sorts of stuff, HTTP stuff even. Like it's well, it's basically like, is this in a log file? Okay. Do you want to take an action on it? Okay. What's your action? Like that's what yeah. it does. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. I think. What yeah, do you think it's it's a few different uh, CIA or log talks about it in the past? So yeah, it's basically anything that's uh, TCP or uh, UDP based uh, you can uh, mess with. And you could you could do a fail to ban protocol method pairing and have that be an entire talk. Like it has so much stuff. Um, so I'm dedicating a handful of bullet points and hand waving it and saying, "Go have fun if you want." Um, so before before you move forward, can you go back two slides? Let me see back two. Let me see where that is. I clicked it twice. I'm waiting on it. Yeah, this one. So yeah, in the hosts LO file, you know, like the SSHD, mm -hmm. uh, you know, describing the LAN environment, right? Mm -hmm. So if I'm using a jump server to uh, reach to my LAN and connect to another computer from the jump server into mm -hmm. some other host in my LAN environment, this yeah. would allow that, right? I mean, it would not uh, kick me out uh, because the... Uh, the the secondary host in the LAN is going to recognize that the jump server is connecting to it, which is on the same LAN, and I would be able to connect to that, right? Yeah. Correct. So the yeah. So the way that you configure that then is you'd if you if you wanted both of those boxes to have the config file, then your jump box would have whatever your external IP would show up as when you connect, um, and then the box inside the network would have the jump box IP as it's allowed. Does gotcha. that make sense? Yes, it does. Thank you. Yeah. Um, you can also do some weird tunneling and stuff that I'm, again, is more using SSH that I'm not really getting into on this one. And uh, there are some other fancy tricks that you can do, but but the gist of it is that, yeah, you, it would it would see it as being from that jump box. So then it would need to know the jump box's IP. Um, I, I put a big asterisk up here 
on my 6FA after having some talks with some people much smarter than me about what exactly is a factor uh, in authentication, right? So six-factor authentication, and generally it seems to be more or less generally agreed that that would be six types of factors authentication rather than instances of a factor. Um, you know, if you need two passwords to get into a box, is that 2FA here? Is that really just 1FA because it's all passwords? Uh, so it really gets into philo philosophical discussions. So I'm putting a big asterisk and at the bottom you can see, I'm just saying it depends on how you count. Uh, but the, the demo that I screenshotted on a slide, I think it's the next slide, I hope it's the next slide, um, actually did incorporate all of these items, a trusted IP address, uh, a software private key, in this case it was ECDSA uh, dash SK, uh, and then the password to decrypt the private key. Uh, and you saw that in a screenshot a little bit ago, a hardware device to verify the key, the YubiKey, uh, a password for the remote user, and then the TOPT code from the, uh, the Android app that I'm using. Uh, if you wanted to go even farther, you could uh, do things such as uh, schedule the Ethernet ports that would have to be during a certain time. If you wanted to write your own libraries for it or find one, I couldn't find any that did this. You could have a geolocation, something or another, uh, potentially require GPS coordinates and have them be within a certain radius. Um, but at a certain point, that's probably overkill. Uh, you know, and it would, and an attacker might just have a better time walking up to the machine and breaking a window to get to it. Um, so that's, I, I, I consider this, uh, this six FA slide and if it reloads, yeah, I consider this sort of the, the, the going up into the, the, the most practical that you could do. And then sort of on the other side of the mountain is the maybe Maybe, maybe more esoteric stuff or maybe less practical, but could have some niche use cases. Uh, and that really the, those six things are about all that you can chain together practically for like a usable, like I'm going to SSH into this box and do work type environment, um, at least in my opinion. So command restrictions are something that you can do though. And uh, I there's this package I mentioned, the restricted SSH commands. Uh, is so that if you want to allow more than just one restricted command without having to put in the key multiple times. So at the beginning of the key, I mentioned, remember I mentioned that uh, you, can, you can put a bunch of stuff in front of the key, like from the IP address. You can also put command equal and it will only let the user run that command. Now, the fun thing about this is that notice we've restricted our command to restricted SSH commands. And that is a special command that basically reads this config file and restricted user is actually the name of the user. So the syntax, as best as I could tell, is drop a file that matches the username of, you know, what you're trying to restrict. And then regex, regex all the way down. So uh, these handful of commands here, the ls, anything starting with a dot, uh, or ls space, anything with a starting with, oh no, the dot, the dot is regex. So any characters should be able to ls anything. I should be able to exit. Um, I should be able to echo stuff and just echo, but not echo anything else. Um, and then I should be able to send no command as well. Um, now, the little quirk that I found is that because I'm not allowing bash, it actually doesn't spin up a shell. As best as I can tell, these one-shot commands like this don't actually let you spin up a shell, even if that's the command you run. They basically let you run your command and then kick you out. Um, so and I'm trying to think if I had one more slide about this. I'm going to hit next and see what happens. Um, nope. Let's go back real quick. Okay. So the way that you do this then is you put, uh, you know, your SSH command, yada, yada, yada. And then at the very end of everything, you put the command you want to run. So put all your parameters and stuff in there first and yada, yada, yada. And then at the very end of your connect string, just put the command and it'll run it and it'll kick you out. And it'll be like, there we go. I did my thing. And I may show that here in a bit if everything plays along. Uh, cryptographic algorithm restrictions. Uh, this this was one that Sean mentioned that I'm like, oh yeah, thanks. I forgot about those. Um, again, one of those that I knew you could do, never touched it. Um, so you, you specify uh, wherever you have your SSHD config. Typically this is in a, in a star.conf, you know, in a, in a, mine is literally like custom.com. In that in that folder where I have all the other config, right? The uh, they'll I'll allow pub keys and disallow passwords and yada yada. Um, you can you can the way that it specifies 
I was reading it online and I typoed it and then I misread it and it was it was a whole mess to try and get the syntax right first time. So I got it right. It was all good. But uh, it looks like that ciphers uh, and I used a capital C because that's the first one that worked uh, and I stopped trying after that. And uh, so put in your ciphers, yeah, ciphers that are command separated. Um, and you can do the same for like hex algorithms and like basically everything. If you SSH attack VV or VVV or whatever, and like see all the stuff that happens, like basically every step of that process, you can restrict it. It is pretty insane. The level of control you have over it. Um, and someone on like some stack overflow type something or another, we're like, oh yeah, well, if you want to check and see if it worked, run this little nmap script. And I'm like, that's cool. That's going in the slide deck and getting referenced in the speaker notes. Client with uh, SSH with reverse mode turned on, and it'll actually say which ciphers are being negotiated during the connection. Yeah. So uh, the mentioned mentioned comment was if you connect with verbose mode, it'll it'll tell you what's happening as well, not just uh, yes. not just each step, but what it's using and all that. The so negotiation. If you can install nmap on a lockdown workstation, you can always dash via it. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, which could be very useful if you if you don't have access to Nmap. I'm following now. And yeah, I've only used the V for troubleshooting. I think that was an integration tactic. And just to point out here that uh, really some of I guess all of those uh, algorithms you have listed aren't terrible, but if you decide to use like DES or something like that, you're you're not only bad, but you should feel bad. Yeah. Well, and the six was default, and so the. the because uh, right, I logged in and it worked. I I didn't want to dig through SSH hack triple V output, uh, so I just didn't map the thing again to see. Oh look, it dropped it down to two now. Yep, it worked. <laughs> I got the config right. Um, uh, can you pull up that question? So it's uh, never seen SSH. Uh... Yeah. So the the dot D. Uh, yeah, so it's it's a system wide config, um, but it affects users. Yeah, system wide server side, so that's where your daemon's running. Um, as far as I know, side too. Yeah, I was gonna say you can set client side, but it wouldn't be the daemon. It would be instead of the sshd underscore config, it would just be ssh underscore config. Um, if you wanted to set system wide, if you want to set per user. And that would be in the user's home folder dot ssh slash config, typically. Does that answer the question? I think. Yeah, but okay. that's a single file. I was wondering if uh, anybody's ever seen, it seems like it'd be more logical to put every host in a separate conf file if, if there was a underscore D folder in, uh, it for, available for an individual, but just a while here, no worries. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, I'm assuming the reason not is because it gets into permissions with, with Etsy file structure and whatnot. Uh, the user stuff will typically go under the, the user's home folder. Um, but yeah, so logon limits are another one of those. Did I skip the slide? I don't think I skipped the slide. I'm just double checking. Yeah, there we go. All right, logon limits. Uh, you know, one of those things that I feel is a little esoteric, but I mean, I, I could see in some context that it might be a little niche. Um, you can you can restrict it, right? Just like you can prevent fork bombs by uh, setting some limits in your security limits or one of those limit files. I don't know if it's actually this one for fork bombs or not. Uh, but you can put the username. Again, my username for the restricted user is restricted user. Um, I set a hard limit of one. Um, and you can set it for a user group or the whole system. So if you, if you, if I understand right, you can actually just say that, uh, the whole system gets gets one login versus this user gets one link login on the system. There was also something about whether it was local user versus remote. Um, I I didn't play around with that much. I basically tried to set up two SSH connections, and the second one gives me this error message that you can see saying there are too many logins for a restricted user. Bye. Um, so that's simultaneous uh, logins then. Uh, yeah, simultaneous login. So uh, in one, basically one terminal, try to open up another terminal window and try it again. And the second one doesn't work. Uh, oh, and you can see the login banner, uh, but it does not execute commands. So if you have a one-shot command, like I mentioned on the command restrictions thing, it, it doesn't do that thing. It doesn't get that far in the process. It's only far enough to give you the, 
the little the little banner and to tell you your last login and all that, and then it boots you because it does not actually complete the login, so it doesn't run the command. Email notification is my favorite thing. Um, I do them kind of janky, uh, but you know it's 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 better than not. This is what I do with my personal stuff. Um, you can see, yes, that looks like Gmail because it is. I have these going to one of my Gmail addresses, and it's heavily redacted here for the public recording and all that. Uh, but basically, uh, Pam supports this, the pluggable authentication modules. You tweak a couple little things in the config file. And, uh, and again, this presentation is to teach you all the nitty gritty because, well, we'd, we'd be here all night. I could do a presentation just on this with all the different Pam variables and ways you can set it up. Uh, but yeah, there are different variables there. Each of those things, it's a black bar um, in the body of the email is actually a variable. Uh, that I'm just printing out to the email. And uh, well, the timestamp might be a command, but our host, the user, the host name. Uh, you can email on password fails, email on successes. Uh, I did not find a way to get it to email on a pub key fail. Again, goes back to the whole fail to ban thing and why it seemed like they couldn't do that uh, because it doesn't get far enough in the process. If I really fought with it, I probably could, but whatever. Um, there are some of the variable types you can do. And there's a whole, again, in the speaker notes, I've got citations on how to do all that and whatnot. Um, so before I poke and try and demo a little bit, and I may request you stop recording for the demo once we get to that point, we can keep recording for now though. Um, anyone have any questions? Here's a QR code that should just encode that URL, that URL is the slide deck you just saw, uh, view only where you can see all the speaker notes and whatnot. <laughs> No. So the only comment that I'll I'll make here is uh, I did just read the latest uh, uh, communications of the ACM and like one of the first articles. Of course, this was right while the Super Bowl was happening, and there was that QR code for that janky Chinese uh, uh, clothing store that apparently is trying to be a thing now. Uh, yeah. Well, so yeah, right, right is I was reading the. Uh, please don't use QR codes or dangerous uh, article. Uh, that's when I looked up and saw, huh, nationwide QR code uh, blitz. Yeah, definitely want to do that with uh, Chinese uh, stuff. So yeah, well, QR codes. QR codes, side rant. QR codes are not dangerous. It's poor implementation of scanning them that's dangerous. Um, QR codes are just data. It's no more dangerous than text. If you have an OCR thing that is randomly executing text that it OCRs, that's bad. If you have a QR code reader that's randomly executing the code in the QR code, that's bad. Uh, rant over. But anyhow, if there are no questions, uh, uh, if I can request that we stop the recording and I will change my sharing setting. Oh, we there's, there's uh, one, so we'll, there is one thing that I... <laughs> Sorry, Hakan, go ahead. Yeah, there is one thing that I read um, on a like a free BSD kind of like a guru website about uh, recalculating uh, or redefining some moduli. Like this is uh, apparently some kind of like an algorithm that like do you, you use this um, SSH keygen command uh, mm -hmm. to recalculate like moduli with, uh, you know, uh, certain parameters, etc. cetera. Uh, and his argument was that uh, you know, like the distributions come with um, pretty much pre-calculated pre moduli. And if you uh, get your computer kind of like work, which I did actually, and it takes quite a while, you know, like maybe an hour or something like that to uh, use that algorithm to recalculate moduli, et cetera, um, that uh, he argued that um, that would uh, harden, I guess, uh, your SSH, you know, like server setup because you are not using the default moduli or whatever. So I just wanted to throw it out here. I, I have no expertise, as you all know, uh, but uh, that was something that I thought was interesting and, uh, you know, like uh, deviating from what came with the distribution package seemed promising to me or sounded promising to me. Gotcha. Yeah, that's good to know. I have, I'm not familiar with that. So I, I'm, I'm going to have to look it up now, though, because you got me real curious. Uh, one thing that I do know and I have seen uh, that's probably in a similar vein, but not quite the same, 
is if you are using an image of any sort, like a, uh, a VM template or whatnot, um, and you don't change your host key and you just sort of deploy it as is, a lot of times those are not set to regenerate the host key, um, which I actually saw at a cyber defense competition recently, which was really interesting as we go to log into each box. And it was like, we've seen this on four other boxes. Are you sure this is the right machine? Um, which is more of an adversary in the middle concern, but yeah, uh, I'll have to go look up the moduli stuff because I'm. I, I yeah, just I just posted the link to the chat, uh, okay, you know, cool. for your convenience. Make sure to, to grab that for me. Any other questions? Yeah, I've also seen along that same lines of regenerating uh, your host certificates. Uh, there was there for a while, I think, a vulnerability, and everyone basically had to regenerate their host keys. Oh, fun. Or at least it was recommended how many people actually did. And well, that's a whole nother discussion. Um, Matt Blaze actually had something before he switched up uh, his careers and started getting into uh, law. But he was uh, setting the random generation seeds for different programs and that kind of stuff. And here's the, the funny TLDR of the whole thing. Windows actually implemented the best random number generator seed out there out of all the um, different tools that were out there. Apparently for random number uh, generations for the seeds for the uh, what they need. Um, apparently Linux only uses about a quarter of what they could available for them when you look at the distribution graph. So yeah, if you ever guys ever want to see something about for what uh, security, look up anything from Matt Blaze and his cryptography stuff before he got out of it. Uh, Will, do you know when that was? Mm, 2016. Oh, the past year or two during the pandemic, but just after they were working on that really increasing. Interesting. Yeah, we were hearing about that too. Okay, uh, killing the uh, recording then. Recording demo time. Uh, let's Just see. Just selecting more paranoid until I get everything.